Hello and welcome to the Llama Podcast. I'm Peter Bowes and Llama, Live Long and Master Aging, is where we explore the science and stories behind human longevity. Today, why do women live longer than men? Are there lifespan or health span issues that are unique to the sexes? In this episode, we're going to talk about human longevity as it applies to women. I'm joined by Dr. Felice Gersh, who's a gynecologist and the founder and medical director of the Integrative Medical Group of Irvine, which is in Orange County here in California. Felice received her medical degree from the University of Southern California, Keck School of Medicine, that's in Los Angeles. She writes and is a prolific speaker around the world on issues relating to to women's health. Dr. Gersh, it's really good to see you. Well, thank you, Peter. It's great to be here. Integrative medicine, functional medicine, what is that? It's what medicine should be. It's a different way of looking at the way the human body has evolved and what really constitutes health and health care. But it really should be what all medical care should be. So what does that mean? It means that we look at the whole human being, like every aspect that contributes to health, things like aspects of lifestyle, emotional health, the um, diet, nutrition, sleep, stress, and the environmental effects of environmental toxins and so forth. And then we have a bigger toolbox. So we don't just use pharmaceuticals and surgery. We use every evidence-based medicine technique that, that exists to try to help people to obtain optimal health So that could include things like acupuncture and homeopathy, herbals, and stress reduction, things such as guided imagery and meditation. So basically, it's an expanded toolbox while we look at the person as a whole. And how much of this did you learn when you did that original medical degree? Well, Peter, that's a great question. Actually, I had to unlearn about half of everything that I did learn. I was taught so much misinformation. And I think we had about a half an hour that was spent on nutrition when I was in medical school. We learned nothing about exercise. We learned nothing about how to deal with stress, knowing that the leading cause of most medical visits actually involves something with emotion and sleep and pain, which links to emotion. We we had no tools for any of that. It was really what we call pill to the ill. What's your single most important, in your opinion, problem, your symptom? So we, ha- we worked on a, a system where you ask the patient, what is your chief complaint? So you're, you're allowed one complaint. <laughs> and, and in reality, the body works in so many mysterious and amazing ways that when you're ill, you're not going to have one complaint because every organ links to every other organ. So That's what really makes life so impossible for what I'll call the conventional or allopathic doctor because they are trained to look at what's your organ that's the problem, what's your single complaint. And in reality, when you have something wrong, like if we touch on like the gut microbiome, you're going to have systemic inflammation. And inflammation, which can be caused by many, many different things, is underlying almost every ill in the body. But that can manifest differently in different people or in multiple ways in the same person with a myriad of symptoms involving any organ system. So you have people coming in with complaints involving their head and their gut and their joints and their skin and all these things, and of course, emotional and sleep. And then the doctor who has no tools to deal with any of this looks at the patient and says, here's your antidepressant and have a nice day. (laughs) So they really don't have a clue what to do with these people. And that's actually one of the things that spurred me on to go into integrative and functional medicine, because I recognized that I didn't know what I was doing other than cutting out organs. And that really was not the way I wanted to practice medicine. And was there something, did something happen that that made you realize this, that there was much more to medicine than the conventional approach? It was both a mixture of a process and a sudden type of thing. So I have always felt that there was much more to healthcare than just giving a pill or doing surgery. So from the very, practically the inception of my practice, I had what I call ancillary services in my office. I had a Chinese medicine practitioner with me. She just retired, but she was with me for over 20 something years. As well, on and off, I've had different nutritionists and psychological counselors. I've had biofeedback. I've had the same massage therapist now for 
probably 15 years. So I've actually incorporated many different services in my practice other than the conventional from the beginning. But I myself had no specific training in anything but the conventional. So what happened was I actually got some sleep. After 25 years of doing obstetrics and thousands of deliveries, it was time for me to stop. And after I stopped, I actually demanded that every pharmaceutical rep that came through my office, and there was a parade of reps that came through my office in those days, I said, show me your studies. For the first time in my life, I said, you have to show me why I should prescribe this drug. And as I looked at their data, it really was um, really astounding how little the effects that were beneficial deviated from the effects of a placebo. And when I looked at the array of side effects, I couldn't figure out why I would prescribe this drug. And I lived through what I call the beginning of the heyday of big pharma, when it seemed like every few months there was a new mega drug, you know, that was the billion dollar new hit that was going to do something amazing for people. And I bought into all of that in the beginning. So I was what I would call an early utilizer of every pharmaceutical that came out. And then I got burned because I would use these drugs and I would say, hey, look at the new great thing, I'm gonna help you. And then before I knew it, it was black, uh, it had a black box warning on it. Some of them were taken off the market because they were killing people or causing terrible effects. So I just said, this is not really working and these drugs have almost no real benefit. So, and then I started thinking, and what is the mechanism of these drugs? Like, how are they really working? Because before that I had just said, smarter people than I, that work in research, they figure out how this stuff works. And I'm a clinician, I just use it, I prescribe it. But then I said, no, I gotta know more than that. I have to understand why this drug is going to have this effect and what are the other, alt what I call additional damages. Mm. So everything has additional damages, as you know, from watching television commercials. So I um, went on a journey. I started randomly taking courses, not knowing what I was doing with no mentors and no, no guidance, and I ended up in a room in Portland, Oregon, with a bunch of naturopathic doctors. And I had no idea who they were. I'd never even heard of a naturopathic doctor at the time. And the one person who was lecturing was a medical doctor. And I went up to her, and her name was Dr. Lodog. And I said, Dr. Lodog, you and I are the only MDs in this entire room of naturopathic doctors. And I just took this course because it sounded good. I looked at it online, and I'm just looking for answers. So she said, in two weeks, the Fellowship in Integrative Medicine will begin another class at the University of Arizona School of Medicine. Why don't you join us? I just apply. So when I got home, I applied. And two weeks later, I was in Tucson. Two years later, I graduated. And so I'm fellowship trained OBGYN. There are very few in the world. And it was no looking back from there. So I took more and more courses. And I had spoken in the past as a speaker for Big Pharma for many different pharmaceuticals that came out for women's health. So I had experience as a speaker, and I just moved into the new world that I was in, and I started speaking and educating on integrative and functional medicine. Mm. Interesting background. So let's tackle, in terms of women's health, the first question that I posed there, because it's, it's intrigued me, and it's intrigued a few listeners to this podcast who've posed the same question. Why do women live longer than men? Well, the bottom line answer is nobody really knows for sure, but I will definitely give you my opinion. And the interesting thing is that that actually holds true across all civilizations. So some of the theories may or may not really hold water. Like one of the theories is, well, men are more risk takers and they're involved in more dangerous pursuits. So they are more likely to die, you know, because they're the ones out there doing the protecting and the um, exploring and, and, you know, just in dangerous things. Plus, well, maybe in the, the hunting, gathering sort of era, but I, I right. wonder if that applies today. It doesn't seem to too much, although maybe for crazy teenage boys who do, you know, wild things with their cars or whatnot. But if you look beyond that, even if you look at people who've reached say, the age of 55 or thereabouts, they're probably not going to be doing too many risk-taking adventures. Um, men still will have a shorter expected average lifespan than a woman. So, of course, it's due to my favorite hormone, which is estrogen. That's what I believe. And it's interesting, though, I think this is going to change. So estrogen, if we go back to estrogen for a moment... Estrogen, Actually, yes, just explain how that applies to men. Right. Well, estrogen 
is the most maligned and insulted of all hormones because after the Women's Health Initiative was shut down uh, over 15 years ago now, the conclusion, which was completely erroneous, was that estrogen does all kinds of terrible things to people. It gives you cancer, it gives you dementia, it gives you heart attacks and strokes. And I mean, that's a whole big, long lecture. But the bottom line is that they did not use human estrogen. They weren't giving it to the right population nor in the right formulations and dosing and so on. But estrogen, from basic science, we know is actually an antioxidant. It's anti-inflammatory. It actually is the body's master of metabolic homeostasis. It regulates virtually every enzyme the way that, you know, in terms of gene expression, in terms of manipulating how the body really works in terms of appetite and metabolic functions, it also helps regulate the process of inflammation. So estrogen is really a natural anti-inflammatory agent. It's interesting, all the organs in the body that really need to be on alert for inflammation can make their own estrogen. Of course, that's how men get estrogen. They make it in their peripheral organs and in fat tissue because estrogen is critical to brain development. That's how children get it. That's why en endocrine disruptors, things like lead, mercury, are so damaging to children's brains because they interfere with the function of estrogen in the brain. So women have all this production of estrogen, which acts as an anti-inflammatory. It controls the immune system. Most people don't realize that, that estrogen has a receptor on every immune cell in the body and regulates the production of what we call inflammatory cytokines, the inflammatory particles that create havoc when they are produced in a chronic manner. Because inflammation is supposed to be short-term to um, protect the body from things like invading bacteria and viruses and injuries. But when you have chronic inflammation, which is now basically an epidemic due to environmental mm -hmm. toxins and poor sleep, circadian rhythm dysfunction, poor diets, it just you know we we've kind of done everything to live in a um, a way that's going against the way we were programmed genetically to live. And our modern way of living is it just encouraging that? Absolutely. But women have this little inborn uh, safety net, which is estrogen, which of course. It, which is lost universally for every woman when she hits menopause, which is why women start rapidly catching up to men in the incidence of things like cardiovascular disease. O over a certain age? Over, around like around 40? the age. Well, the perimenopause starts somewhere in the 40s. Right. And the average woman will stop having menstrual cycles and producing estrogen in very significant amounts around age 51. So are you saying that women get to about that age, but they have an advantage over men at that point? But then from about that stage, they age roughly the same? Well, they have a little bit, I'll say, of a cushion that comes from the earlier years because they have more flexibility of their arteries and so on. But it's not its not long-lasting. It, so they do have that advantage. But if you look at certain organs, like the brain, women have, oh, almost three times the incidence of Alzheimer's. Two-thirds of all Alzheimer's patients are women. So the brain does not have the resiliency to keep going the way the heart sort of manages. But estrogen is very key to reducing the impact of strokes, for example. We know from studies in in rats and mice that if they have estrogen on board, they have much less damage to the brain if they uh, put a compression on the carotid artery to stop the blood flow to the brain. But the, one of the things that I fear is that this advantage that women have with estrogen as an antioxidant and anti-inflammatory agent, which actually allows them to live a few more years, statistically, a few more years than men because of a, almost, you know, what is it? 35 years that they have of all this estrogen that men don't get to that same degree. But women are not living the way they were programmed originally. We know that pregnancy actually helps to protect women later in life. In fact, they've now shown that women who have, who have not had a pregnancy, for example, they've never delivered a baby, they have a statistically higher risk of developing breast cancer than other women who have had babies. So there's something magical about 
having babies, uh, nursing babies, and having normal menstrual cycles that really contributes to this whole anti-inflammatory effect of estrogen during the reproductive years. But women today aren't living that way. Do we, do we understand, you say magical, do we understand the mechanisms? Yes, there we do. Um, estrogen regulates the production of many, many enzymes that work. Uh, and I could list a whole bunch of them, but basically enzymes that help prevent oxidation of LDL, which is cholesterol. Yep. So only oxidized LDL can cause plaque. Because if it doesn't matter how much cholesterol you have. In fact, cholesterol is essential for life. And ch as another demonized, very important element of life is cholesterol. In fact, the body thinks it's so important that many cells can make it their own cholesterol, not just the liver. And the body has ways to recycle to bring back the cholesterol so you don't excrete it. So that's how important cholesterol is. And of course, all the thinking about dietary cholesterol has pretty much been debunked yes. from what it was a decade or so ago. Yes, as will a lot of the incorrect ideas about cholesterol as a whole and about estrogen as a whole. So basically, estrogen like I mentioned, controls all the inflammatory cells. It prevents oxidized LDL. It actually helps the brain to make a very important factor called brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which keeps the brain working much better. It controls the macrophages, which is an immune cell that's present both peripherally, it's called macrocytes when they're in the blood, and they're called microglia in the brain. And estrogen is so important that both men and women have these other cells that are part of the, the glial system. They're part of the immune cell system. They're called astrocytes or astroglia. And they have the capability to make estrogen, but they normally don't. But if you have like a brain trauma, like from an injury to the brain, or you have a stroke, the astrocytes will actually upregulate their enzyme aromatase to actually start making estrogen. And that actually reduces the inflammatory process and the damage to the brain from such a trauma. So estrogen is protective, and women have all these different um, ways to make it and have so much more peripherally. But nowadays, as I mentioned, many women don't have babies. They don't nurse their babies like they used to in years and generations past. They're also almost 90% of women are on oral contraceptives, and often for decades of their lives. And people talk about these as hormones, but they are not. And I have great concern about what this will do to longevity for women. And nobody is really looking at this. They, they give these pills out like they're, like they're okay, but they're actually endocrine disruptors. And you can actually go into the literature and on like PubMed where they have all the peer-reviewed articles published, uh, and you'll see it's listed everywhere that ethanol estradiol, the pretend estrogen that's in oral contraceptives, is an endocrine disruptor, as are the pretend progesterones. They're all endocrine disruptors. And in the wild, they actually change gender and alter the reproductive function of fish. So what you're saying is, certainly with as it applies to estrogen, women are pre-programmed. There's an evolutionary aspect to this, simply to live longer. They are. And because... And why is that? I don't think it's necessarily because nature had any grand plan. After, re after menopause, there is no plan. Because there's no reproduction that can cause evolution. If you have no reproduction after menopause, there's no reproductive um, evolutionary benefit to anything. So it's really just lucky for women, you might say, because Because they, you could actually argue that after menopause or the age equivalent for men, there's no use for either of the sexes. There isn't. I think it's just nature sort of throws its hands up and says, you're on your own. Good luck. And for women, they have really rapid catch up to men in terms of many, many things. Like we talked about heart disease and the incidence of stroke after menopause is higher for women than in men and they are more fatal. Heart attacks, the first heart attack for women has a much higher mortality than for men. There's certainly plenty of cancer. Colon cancer is actually um, prevented by estrogen, and that actually was one of the few benefits that came from the Women's Health Initiative, which didn't get much play. But estrogen is protective of the gut, and the, there are receptors everywhere, all over the body for estrogen. And ev virtually every tissue has estrogen receptors. It's so important, including in the gut. So I think it's just a lucky thing that nature really wants women 
to be able to survive childbirth, which is a huge stress on the body. It's that we look at pregnancy and childbirth as the ultimate stress test for a woman. In fact, we now know that women who will say fail this stress test, they have a complication of pregnancy, whether it's preterm delivery or gestational diabetes, or they get uh, gestational hypertension, preeclampsia, also known as toxemia. So if they get any of these really significant complications during pregnancy, they are more likely not to have as long a life. They are very high risk to develop hypertension, metabolic syndrome, and diabetes once they hit menopause, and they lose that protective effect of estrogen. Is there any data on the number of children that women have in terms of its effect on longevity? It appears that the most critical number is one. Oh. Isn't that amazing? If As long as you at least have one, Oh, and, at least one. Well, so well, in other words, having no, gone through the, the bodily process. Yeah, there's something amazing. But the other thing, though, is that women are actually programmed to do best if they have their baby very young, but that how we would look at it is very young. For example, if a woman has her first baby before she's 20, like who's doing that now? Well, I was going to say, like women used to, though. That's what they were programmed to do. Women used to have a much later puberty, around 16, and then they would typically get pregnant around 18 and have their first baby around 19, and then nurse their baby for about three years. Under those circumstances, those women have almost 100% protection against breast cancer. There's, there's like a whole, a whole process that goes on that pr is very protective. But, you know, this whole idea that women will live longer than men, I think another generation from now, we're not going to see it. You said nurse their babies for three years. Do you mean actually nurse the baby for three years? I do. To feed the baby? Right. If you look at primitive societies, the average length of time for nursing is over three years. Now, they're also eating food. <laughs> Once they're about six, seven months old, or certainly by a year, they're eating food as well. But if you allow children to self-determine when they want to wean, it's usually over three years. As, of course, most animals do. Well, Left the equivalent. To their own, unless right. they're farmed animals they, and you control their environment. They just, I saw, like, last week, one of the primates, I forget which, I think it was the orangutans, they nurse for eight years. <laughs> so it's really, like, the winners for length of nursing. Interesting. Well, there's amazing, it's another whole topic, but there's amazing um, longevity attributes to breast milk. So my, one of my missions is to educate women so that they know what, what's going to happen, you know, in terms of statistics, if they don't have any children or if they delay having their children until they're like in their 40s, the biggest problem then is that fertility is dramatically reduced, of course, in the 40s. Nature really wants women to have babies in their 20s, you know, and then, but they, they give them, you know, a little bit of a, a break to let them do their mothering and so on later in life. But the risk of complications is certainly dramatically higher as you get older. And what about you look at the you take a holistic approach? What about just the experience of being a mother and having a family? How does that affect a woman's longevity? Well, this is something that I've actually been thinking about in terms of um, what happens when you have children in terms of your overall health? We know that if you have very, very um, large numbers of children, it can be very depleting because um, every time you have a baby, the baby steals from you, so to speak. It doesn't return, so it can't really be borrowing. So it takes your calcium from your bones. But fortunately, nature actually, as long as you have some time period between babies and then have time when you're not pregnant, the bone will rebuild. It's, nature does do that for you. It also takes a lot of your iron so that the baby can have enough iron to build its own blood and so on. And iron is critical for mitochondrial function. So too many pregnancies can actually be depleting. I, lo I, try, I looked into this, and there's really almost no data. Nobody's really tracking this. But my own personal opinion is that probably if you have children that are closer, there's, there's some actually some data. If you have babies that are closer than about maybe 13, 14 months apart, and you keep doing that, that's really harmful because you really don't have time to replete all your nutrients and, and so on and get really strong again for your, for your body. So probably having children 
at least two years apart would be good. Three years is probably better. If you look at ancient civilizations, they tended to not have children as close as we sometimes do now because they would nurse and there would be sort of, you know, some prohibitions about having a lot of sex when you're nursing babies and they would nurse over three years. So the, the children were spaced apart more in more primitive societies. They didn't usually have like one every year. That became more common. I wouldn't say it's just modern, but you say maybe in more like 1700s and thereafter, but because that's not really a primitive society anymore. And what about the spiritual or the psychological impact of being a mother and having children and bringing up a family in later life? How does that affect you? Does it give you a reason to live and to live longer because you have offspring? Well, if we look at the entire realm of spirituality and emotional well-being, we know that it's linked to longevity. And human contact and having purpose and love in life is just enormously important. Just giving infants, for example, if we go back, if you just give infants food, but they don't have love, they, they don't thrive. We call it failure to thrive. They don't gain weight. They don't do well. Their brains don't develop properly. Humans need humans. They need touch. They need love. They need purpose. And women, you know, I, well, most women, it's not, you know, nothing's universal, but um, having that sort of maternal feeling is very powerful for women. I mean, women can walk by and see another baby, and I'm sure if you did a functional MRI, you'd find their brain change. Because we are programmed to love babies, to nurture, to um, have that kind of home. And I think that when women don't have that, it does shorten their lives, you know, statistically. You don't, don't want to make broad generalizations, but certainly... So you're saying that anecdotally as opposed to based on data? I have seen data on the importance of connectivity, relationships, love, which is definitely what having a family is all about. I have also seen my own patients who've had problems with relationships where they've become estranged from their children, and they have done very poorly. They almost always develop a medical problem. Now, we can keep people alive often with medical problems, but, but things happen that are bad. They develop hypertension. They sometimes get a cancer. So it's amazing how stress and not having love and, and having a relationship with your children is definitely enormous stress. So I think that it is important for everyone, but I think women who have the maternal instinct, which is, I think, built into us genetically, really do have that very powerfully, and I think that really is a part of their longevity. And it's interesting, they now have studies that show that the fetal tissue implants in the maternal brain. So you always carry as a mother part of your children in you, in your brain. So nobody knows exactly what that is all about. Explain that. How do you mean the fetal tissue implants in the They've brain? They've actually found fetal DNA in maternal brain. It, it's like universal. Hmm. And we used to think that there was this block I mean, this is part of the how much information I was taught incorrectly when I was in school. So we were taught that, just as we were originally taught that there is this impenetrable blood-brain barrier, that what's circulating in the blood doesn't get in the brain, we know that's completely false. Everything circulating in the brain is, in the, in the blood is going to get into the brain. Uh, and then we were taught that what goes on in the fetal circulation is completely separate from the maternal circulation. Now we know that's completely wrong. In fact, at about 10 weeks gestation, you can do a blood test on the mother and you can find fetal DNA and you can actually do a chromosome type. So you can actually find out what is the gender and if they have any chromosomal abnormalities before even three months of gestation because of circulating fetal cells. And those circulating fetal cells actually cross the blood-brain barrier and implant into the maternal brain. And it may have to do with preventing rejection of the baby, you know, so that the, because it's a foreign body and our immune system should just reject it, but it doesn't. So it may have something to do with altering our immune response, but that tissue stays forever. So our children become part of us, literally part of us. And I think that that's part of nature making moms just love their children that much more 
and putting up with crap when they do bad things. <laughs> it's exactly. like, but this is part of me. How could I not love this thing? And that pre-programmed instinct of, of women that you talk about to be maternal, presumably, therefore, that carries on to grandmothers and older women as well, their response to, to being with children, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren. Absolutely. It never goes away. And, and I, me, I wonder if that sometimes helps people of that age, 70, 80, 90, it is another reason, it perhaps a, a new impetus to keep going. Absolutely. We were talking before about my aunt, and she is very connected to her family. I this, think, is, this is before we started the podcast. So just give, right. me, the, give me the background <laughs> right. here. Um, my mom's sister is over 90, and she's amazing. She's actually in Paris right now, and she flew there by herself and then met her granddaughter there a day later, but she made the whole trip by herself. She took an Uber and she's been Ubering around Paris by herself, had um, tea and then by the Seine River. And then she had wine at a pub that was down the street. And, and she is incredibly connected to her family. And that gives her strength and power. And the love is like, like the secret sauce, right? That keeps us going. I think we know that when people lose someone and they're old, they often die themselves shortly thereafter. And I've just so many stories uh, about that. I have. I've heard them too. I know them so many of those and, and personal acquaintances. And so love can keep us alive and despair can kill us. So um, I think that there is this overabundance that has no no limits, no end of love that women can have for their families and their children, their grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And the most important thing, I think, for our society is to keep nurturing that because we do live in a society where often people become disconnected because people move away. And so keeping the connection, even at a long distance, is so important for emotional health. And then, of course, emotional health is physical health. There is also this thing of often referred to as the longevity gene, that some people just seem to have it. And, and actually, contrary to some of the things you've been saying, it doesn't matter what style of life they live, who they surround themselves by, what they eat. Some people just seem to be programmed to live a very long time. That is true, but that is the minority. So no Very one, much the minority. No one should assume that they are that lucky one. So there are some people who just have have it all right in terms of how their bodies can detoxify, for example, so that they can be exposed to the same amount or even more toxins, which would otherwise completely disconfigure how the mitochondria, like the energy creating factories of the cell work, and the, the liver with its detoxification pathways, somehow or other, their brains are great at dealing with inflammation. They don't have it. So there are people like that. I think one was like George Burns, who was smoking and drinking, and he was over 100 and cracking jokes. But so there are people that luck out with the the perfect combination of genes. But on the other hand, I do want to mention that there are people that now, because we are doing genetic testing, that we're finding out that they have what, what sometimes would be called the Alzheimer's gene. And women who have that, that is the APOE, the four. And women who have that statistically have a substantially higher risk, even above the average of women, which women have higher risk than men anyway for Alzheimer's, but they have even higher yet. Genetics are not destiny. So people need to know that. It's how genes get expressed. So that's where lifestyle comes in. That's part of my job. If I can help people to adopt the healthiest lifestyle, eating lots of fruits and vegetables, of course, organic, because chemicals and pesticides and herbicides are not health foods. They should never be in our food, of course. But if they can exercise, they can sleep well, and they can have the joy, you know, the, the proper love and spirituality in their life and life balance, if we give all those things to them and then they actually ad adopt them into their lives, the fact that they have a bad gene like the APOE4 does not mean that they will not live a very long and cognitively well life. And I have t tested people who have the four and they'll tell me, which is very wonderful, that everyone in their family has had perfect functioning of their brains and lived well into their 90s. And I say, some of those people had the four. I don't know which ones because it's inherited. So some of those people who had those great long lives had the four. So that doesn't mean 
that knowing that you have the four, that you're going to have this bad outcome. So it's really important that people don't get genetic testing and then feel doomed. Let's talk about the gut. You've mentioned it already, stomach health. Let's go back to basics and explain, first of all, what's happening in there that could potentially be actually so bad for us. Well, the most amazing thing is that there's this incredible advanced civilization of little creatures, the, the microbiota, they're bacteria. They also include fungus and viruses, but we'll focus predominantly on the bacteria. And so there's this incredible civilization that goes on in our bodies. Now, the bacteria are everywhere. In fact, that's another thing I had to unlearn. Is what, I was taught that many organs are sterile, like inside of the uterus, inside of the bladder, the placenta. It turns out all of those, even the ovaries, the tubes, everything has a microbiome. So bacteria don't know that they should stop at a certain point. They just keep going. Of course, they inhabit everything. And a microbiome is a the, mini environment in itself? Yes. So um, the microbiome is the collective genome or the genetic material of these little creatures, we'll say the bacteria. So that's the microbiome. Now, so you have a microbiome of everything. Then there's a microbiome of the sinuses, of the skin, of the, the lungs. In females, they have of the vagina. It turns out it's like every single organ you know, that we know every time we look at it. Some people are talking about there's a microbiome of the brain. That's really new. The biggest microbiome is in the gut. And it's from the mouth. The mouth has its own. This is like a whole amazing story too, the mouth microbiome. And that has been really mucked up because people use toxic toothpaste and mouthwash. And they actually, you know, they used to have this commercial of a product that said, kills germs on contact. You may have heard that, <laughs> mouthwash. And actually those germs keep us alive. So we do not want to kill those germs. And Just it, stop you there. You said toxic toothpaste. We don't consider toothpaste generally to be toxic. We well, don't purposefully use toxic toothpaste. No, that's toothpaste. true. So and and I, I get excited about it. But okay, so the toothpaste is not actually toxic to the humans. This is what we hadn't realized. It's toxic to our little bacteria that live in our mouth because we're, we're thinking, oh, we should kill out the bacteria. So the problem is we did not understand that those bacteria are contributing members to our health. They actually make different enzymes. They, in, like in the gut, the bacteria make neurotransmitters. They make amino acids. They make vitamins. They make these critically important, what we call metabolites, products that actually circulate as signaling agents in the body. And it, they do amazing and very critically important functions. So it turns out that not knowing the function of these bacteria we were under the impression back when we had the bacterial theory of disease and infection that bacteria are evil, they cause infection, and they hurt us. But we didn't understand that the vast majority of the bacteria that live in us and on us are helpful, and not only helpful, like essential to our health. For example, in the mouth, the bacteria that should be there make enzymes that are called reductases, and these enzymes convert nitrates that come from our green leafy vegetables into nitrites, and then it goes into the stomach and in combination with stomach acid and other nutrients like B12 and such, you actually convert it into nitric oxide, which is a critically important signaling agent and antioxidant. But if you don't have the right bacteria in the mouth, you can't do the first step. And it's so, so you can end up with all kinds of inflammation and hypertension because half the nitric oxide in the body should come through the diet, through the gut. So what are you suggesting? We don't clean our teeth? I suggest that you get an organic product that is not listed as antimicrobial and not use antimicrobial mouthwash. You really, you really don't want to do that. It's better to rinse with saline or just with water and then use natural, more organic type products for washing your teeth and such. You don't want to use antibacterial things. In your view, the lines and lines of, of products that we'll see in a, a supermarket with mouthwash, toothpaste, different things we can use, you think the vast majority, from what you're saying, uh, are not good for us? That's correct. They're not good. Uh, you certainly don't want to put bleach in your mouth. And I wouldn't do that. Remember, <laughs> in the U.S., just this past few months, in the last year, they outlawed the use of triclosan, 
which is an antimicrobial agent in soap. And they actually put tricly... It's antimicrobial. It's present in many commercial toothpastes, triclosan as an antimicrobial. So that is really bad. Now, you know, we don't want to kill the good bacteria on our skin either. So we really want to be cautious about what we used to take very cavalierly as, well, we're just killing bacteria. No, those are our friends. You're killing, and some people call the microbiome in the gut actually like an organ. It's as critical as any organ in our body, and it's been decimated. So to have a healthy microbiome, the, the biggest, you know, you have from the mouth all the way down, there's bacteria every which way in our gut. The most numerous collection is in the colon. And they do such critically important functions. Having the right microbiome helps to protect you from cardiovascular disease, from dementia. We now link it to schizophrenia, autism, every kind of neurological disease and emotional problem. So that's how critical the gut microbiome is. So if we think of toothpaste just as an example of damaging the microbiome in our mouths, what are we doing to ourselves to damage the microbiome perhaps the most important, in the stomach? We are eating GMO foods that have these chemicals like glyphosate and the so-called inert ingredients that go with the glyphosate, which now they've done studies are actually as bad or worse than the glyphosate itself. Atrazine, herbicides, pesticides. They've now shown that emulsifiers that are in most processed foods actually will do damage to the gut microbiome. And probably the biggest news in the last year or so is the role of artificial sweeteners, which are incredibly toxic to the gut microbiome and are now linked to diabetes and obesity. The very things that they were supposed to prevent, they actually increase the incidence of. So, um, and of course, one of the other really terrible things for the gut microbiome are antibiotics, which are often hidden in our food because in the U.S., they've been allowed legally to put antibiotics into the animals, you know, into the confined feedlot animals. And why would they do that? Why? A lot of people think it's to prevent infection that they gave antibiotics and still do. They, they've, they've had a voluntary, please don't use it, but voluntary doesn't work because the people who grow the animals, the ranchers and such that have these big commercial outfits, they sell the animals based on weight not based on body composition. So it doesn't matter how much protein they have, it just matters how much they weigh. So it turns out that antibiotics induce obesity. And it, they've now shown that if a human has a minimum of, say, five courses of antibiotics, just that alone doubles their risk of diabetes. Five courses over what period of time? Just over their life. Whenever they hit that they've had. And this is who has not had that. Just I was have, going to say, most people have. Well, that alone has doubled your incidence of diabetes, and then it just goes up from there. And but so if something happens, you go to the, your doctor, and the doctor says you need antibiotics for this. What do you say? How do you make the judgment that you don't and you need to put your longevity in front of whatever the complaint is at the time? It's a tough decision, isn't it? It can be. So antibiotics, think of what the word means, against life. So... The problem is our bacteria are life forms that we are de dependent on. So you have to, like every, like any drug, you have to look at risk and benefit. The use of antibiotics has been just rampant and indiscriminate. We now have guidelines that you should not, for example, rush as soon as you have a sinus infection and get antibiotics. The first sign of an ear infection in a child does not warrant antibiotics. If a woman has a bladder infection and she has no other risk factors, she should not rush and get antibiotics. So people who have a cough, people who have a cold, they don't need antibiotics. People didn't actually die right off the bat if they didn't get antibiotics because they didn't even exist 100 years ago. Not everybody just died when they got a bladder infection or a cough. So we need to stop. We should only give antibiotics when we really, really need to. We now, that's one of my, you know, integrative tools is that I have I can use antimicrobials that are more in herb form. For example, we know that the essential oil thyme, thyme oil, actually kills MRSA. I don't know if the audience knows, that's methicillin-resistant staph aureus. So it turns out that there's this really, really aggressive form of staph bacteria 
that we call MRSA. In other words, it's resistant to the conventional antibiotics. And that's been, of course, a huge problem. There's so many problems with antibiotics. One is that it's killing our good bacteria. Another is that they've become useless in many ways because the bacteria always outsmart them. And eventually they evolve genetically and they can not be sensitive anymore. So staph has evolved so it can be resistant to almost every antibiotic now. And it colonizes, it grows. So if you kill out the good bacteria, something's going to take its place. So it turns out it's this really toxic, aggressive, terrible bacteria. And you can get really horrible infections from MRSA-type staph. And it turns out that something as simple as using oil of thyme, the, the herb thyme, can actually kill it better than a lot of the antibiotics now. So there's actually been a resurgence, and it's, it's small, but growing, of using natural products, which don't create the same effects like antibiotics, to try to treat things. Like, I will treat, if a woman comes in and she has a simple urinary tract infection, she's not diabetic, she's not pregnant, I, I give her herbals, like uva ursi. And I give her herbals that she can take along with hydration and cranberry, blueberry juice and such that can actually naturally help to get rid of these infections. So there's a lot of tools that, that I have in my toolbox that help me to avoid using antibiotics because now that we know the seriousness, it's, this is what the equivalent that they talk about in functional medicine. If you have a course of antibiotics, it's like dropping an atomic bomb on your microbiome. It's that big a deal. It can take a year to recover or maybe never recover. Now they've shown that if you have reduced diversity, if you don't have enough different types of bacteria, your chances of being really healthy are really reduced because each type of bacteria has a special function. Like in a society, if you just wiped out all the plumbers, we'd have a problem. You know, if you wipe out one strain of bacteria, you have a problem in your body because that, that bacterial strain had a special function that now isn't going to get done. You say you're one of the few doctors with your kind of integrative training. Why is it that you are one of the few? Why is it that when most women go to the doctor with that urinary tract infection, they will be prescribed antibiotics when you believe there is a, a different and better way? Why is your area of thinking so against the mainstream? Well, I absolutely believe that over the next few years that my way of thinking will become the predominant way. I think it's evolving that way already. But I think it's because... The medical schools, the education in the medical school is so controlled by the big pharmaceutical companies. They actually pay a lot of money to a lot of the faculty who are doing research. So they need the money. They actually really are dependent, and it's really become ingrained into the medical school education that they're going to learn basically the pill to the ill theory. Now, there are some exceptions. There are a few medical schools around in the country that are including some functional medicine courses and including more nutrition courses, but it's, it's the minority, but it's going, to, it's going to take off. I know it will. And doctors who are in, in practice, the way things have evolved in medical care today, doctors see huge numbers of patients, and they've actually done studies that over 50, 60 percent are suffering from what we call burnout. They're just getting through the day. They're just going through the motions. They, they're so busy and so tired. They see a patient on average every seven minutes. I barely get started in seven minutes with my patients. You know, you, you can't, and then they say you have one, one problem today, you know, like one symptom. So it, they're just exhausted. They're so, burnt so there's, out. A, there's a stock answer for the questions that they get on a, on a daily basis. And it is, like I, I've said in the beginning, people come in with so many complaints, they don't know what to do, and they don't, and no, they don't really know. Like, I was lost myself. I was searching, and I was just taking courses and looking online, like, and there was no one mentoring me. I mean, I was lucky that I found... I call it my tribe now, you know, the other doctors who are like me. And there's a lot of us when we're together, but when you look at the total population of doctors, it's still a very small percentage of doctors who actually have expanded their toolbox to include things, you know, like acupuncture and herbal medicine and meditation and such. But I think it's the doctors are just too tired and overworked, the ones who are practicing now, and the ones that are in training and I've talked to some. I have a cousin who's actually now a, just beginning a fourth year um, as a medical student, and they're not learning anything 
about any of these things that we're talking about. They don't know. They don't even know about the microbiome. It's like, what's happening? This is medical school. It's just that the faculty have been there for a long time. They're all tenured. They're not really forced to learn a lot of new things, and, and it, things just get ingrained. So we're trying to shake it up. We're trying to shake things up right now so that this will not be the case. Just going back to the microbiome of the stomach, we've talked about some of the, the negatives and the, some of the bad things that, in, in your view, we could be doing to ourselves. What about the positives? What action can we take in a positive nature to improve, to optimize the health of our stomach biome? Oh, I, I love that topic, and I talk about it all the time. It's uh, I call it how to nurture your microbiome. So their first thing is to recognize is that they're living creatures. So every living creature needs food. We have starved our microbiome because we didn't know what they should eat. In fact, there was this whole movement, it still kind of exists, that starchy vegetables are bad. Oh my gosh, they're full of starch. Well, it turns out that fiber, which is that starch, fiber is the food of the, ba the bacteria, the microbiome feed off of starch. So where do you get that? Where do you get that fiber? You get it in vegetables. And a lot of the vegetables are root vegetables, which used to be a staple of the diet, tubers and things like that. Yams, sweet potatoes, rutabagas, beets, turnips, carrots. And carrots were maligned. They say, don't eat carrots, they're too starchy. Well, that starch is what feeds the bacteria. They ferment it. And that, and it goes down like an assembly line. So it, it, it goes to one group of bacteria. That's one of the reasons you need a lot of diversity, different types. So it goes to different one. Different colors? Yeah, I, that's how I look at them. I, when I draw pictures, I make them into different colors, like the strawberry flavored bacteria and blueberry. But yeah, you need all different kinds of bacteria. And there's trillions. I mean, it's like the numbers are hard to even imagine. There are trillions of bacteria. Some people think they outnumber us, ourselves, like 10 to 1. It's still debatable, but it, it's certainly at least as many cells that are in our bodies are bacteria as our own. And so you get this fiber, and one group of bacteria ferments it, and then that fermented product goes to the next, and they do another set of fermenting. So it sort of goes down the assembly line of bacteria, and the final product ends up being a, a lot of different types of metabolites, but the key ones are what we call short-chain fatty acids. And one of them, which is called butyrate, actually is food for the lining cells of the gut. So this is critical to maintain health of the gut. The bacteria themselves make mucus, which helps to prevent what we call leaky gut, which then helps to prevent systemic inflammation. Because if you get the wrong bacteria, they make these little particles that, that can actually transfer right through the wall of the intestine and into the system of the body, into the um, immune system that surrounds the body and then into the circulation and you get inflammation. So the gut inflammation leads to systemic inflammation. So you want to feed these little guys. So you got to feed them with lots of vegetables, root vegetables, and whole grains. Grains have been maligned too because they're carbs. Like, like carbs are evil too. No, carbs are not evil. Processed carbs are evil. You know, eating processed sugary cereals and white bread, even wheat bread, any kind of bread is so powderized. You know, the flour is so fine. It's not like old fashioned bread from years ago. And when you say processed, a, a processed food is essentially something that's not in its original form. Right. Man has not improved upon nature ever, really. I mean, nature makes the best food. So when you take food and you start churning it into like little powdered forms, like really like tiny powder, not like the old kind of a mill where it was like more like chunks. So this is like really fine powder. You start adding all kinds of chemicals, like what they call enriched bread. They would take out all the nutrients and then they put in a vitamin pill. It's crazy stuff. So you really, I tell my patients, eat food the way it came on the earth. So you don't really go to much of the supermarket, if you even go to a supermarket, I recommend more farmer's markets as much as possible for your produce, because then you know it was probably just picked the day before. It's very fresh. It hasn't been in a refrigerated compartment for the last 12 months, which a lot of fruit is now, right? They, they refrigerate it for months, and then you eat it, and it's not going to be as nutritious. And maybe don't worry too much about cleaning those carrots and those tubers and those vegetables. A few natural bacteria that you're going to find in the soil is maybe good for you? Well, that's true. Now, you just have to... Right, I would not recommend that if you 
don't know where it's been coming from, but if it's coming from the farmer's market... Or your own garden. Abs- your own garden, even best of all, right? If you can grow your own organic plants, that is the best. Because we now know, like when you talk about children and you get the microbiome started, that that children shouldn't be too clean. Actually, playing in the dirt is very good for children and licking their fingers clean is probably better than washing their fingers clean if you know depending on where they've been but in general in what's your rule on on dropping something on the kitchen floor is it a a two-second rule or do you you have a sort of rule of thumb there i pick it up and eat it pick it up and eat it (laughs) haven't died yet but (laughs) um so basically you need to nurture your microbiome with lots of food and try not to poison it because we do a lot of poisoning of our poor microbiome because you could be cleaning your kitchen floor with chemicals couldn't you Oh my goodness. The when we do what we call detoxes in the office, we try to detox their life. So we try to take the toxins out. Toxin avoidance is challenging, but there are so many cleaning products that are full of solvents and really toxic chemicals and they're completely unnecessary. You can create your own cleaning products with essential oils, even water and vinegar is fine. You do not want to sterilize your house. You don't want to put pesticides everywhere. That's really a problem. They, they've they shown that in a house that uses pesticides for bugs with a newborn, with a little child in the first year of life, that child has a dramatically increased risk of developing leukemia. These are not little things. You do not want to, to do that. And we, we actually... And there are studies that support that? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's really a problem. You don't want children around herbicides and pesticides. It really affects their immune systems. And so when we do detoxes, we want to take toxins out of our food, toxins out of our personal care products, like we talked about toothpaste, but then, of course, there's shampoos and lotions that have things like methylparabens, you know, other types of phthalates. Phthalates are endocrine disruptors. We live in what I call like chemical soup, which is not good for longevity. And then I say you take out the toxic people from your life if you can, because that really will shorten your life if you have a lot of toxic people in your life. Now, some of them you can't get rid of. They may be your relatives. So then you have to put up a pretend force field (laughs) so that they don't, their negative energy doesn't impact on you. So toxic people are what? People with negative personalities, people that just don't feel good to be around? Toxic people are negative people. Absolutely. And Anyone knows how there's like an energy, a positive or negative energy when you can be around people, be in a room of people. People have felt that in like a, like a sporting event. When you're with people who are up and excited, there's just this amazing energy that goes through people. And they, they've had these like, where, where I forget who did it, but where they would take a stranger and the stranger person would suddenly start dancing, you know, and then after a while, Everyone around is like dancing. It's like amazing how human energy is contagious, positive or negative. There are some people, though, who are, you could say they are glass half full people as opposed to half empty people. Those half empty people, you could describe them perhaps as being a little bit negative. Many times they're still good people. Oh, well, that is true. We don't want to say that everyone who has a negative streak is a toxic person. So toxic people are people who literally make you feel sick. So they would be maybe someone who's truly like narcissistic or just always disruptive in a negative way. Most people sort of know a really toxic person when they meet them. We're not trying to eliminate them from earth. We're just trying to eliminate them from your daily life. Because we were having an interesting conversation with a guest on the podcast recently about a melancholy kind of person or personality that in some senses could perhaps be a positive thing. People who lose themselves in thought, but then maybe they'll come up with a great thought at the end of that thinking session. I think some of the great minds have been melancholy people and some of the most amazing creative people have been bipolar, but they're not evil. So I guess I should say toxic people maybe are more like evil people. Maybe they... Or maybe you could just say, I think you know when you come across that person in your life that they're not right for you. They're maybe holding you back in some way from achieving your dreams in some fashion. And maybe, you know, you, you just don't want them to influence you. You don't want people to put you down. You know, there are people who sometimes tell people, you can't do that, you're not good enough. That's, you don't want to hear that. You want to have optimism, positive thinking for you so that you can achieve your dreams hmm. and Actually, that you can have the healthy longevity. Because we know positive, happy thoughts 
lead to a healthy body. I, I totally agree with that. It's a very logical way of thinking to me. I'm curious in terms of your life and your way of life, do you apply everything that you say to yourself? No, but I try to walk the talk. Where do I fall down? Probably is sleep is my biggest problem because I have too much on my plate and I can't get things done by deadlines. Sometimes um, sleep is not as significant in my priorities as it should be. But in, and of course, so many of us are in that position. W- whatever job you do, you could be a, you could be a doctor, right. you could work in the store, you could work in a school or a, ho- a hospital. A vast majority of people that I know will complain about just not having enough hours in the day to, to maybe do their day job and look after the children, do everything else that's involved. So what is the solution to that? Do we just battle on and ignore it? Or what do we do? Do we purposefully say that some things that we're trying to achieve that we shouldn't to make time to sleep? Probably that is the answer. We have to, and like I, like everyone else, we have to decide what our priorities are and make them consciously. So if we say for the next year, I am going to get six hours instead of eight hours of sleep because I have this very concrete goal and I otherwise can't achieve it and I'm willing to accept the consequences. I'm going to try to do everything to reduce the negative consequences. At least you're going in with your eyes open. But we do have a 24-hour day. It's not going to expand anytime ever. And we have to make choices. And it's very hard to make choices where we put our own health as the priority. We often put our health way down the line in terms of what is a priority. And the reality is that Health is probably the most precious thing we own. Trying to regain health, I see this all the time in my practice. Once you actually have a serious condition, trying to reverse it is really hard. And of course, if you have an end-stage disease, there's no way to possibly reverse it. So being proactive with your health is probably something that you should put way at the top of your priority list. And, And it's something that all of us, including myself, have to be reminded of that You can't take your health for granted. I see this all the time in my practice where something really dreadful happens to people who never in a million years would have thought that something like that would happen to them, like a cancer diagnosis and such, or suddenly a heart attack or a stroke. So we don't want to take our health for granted. We all should get enough sleep and just say, you know what, so maybe I won't accomplish this or I won't do that and just accept maybe I'll earn less money, whatever it is, maybe we really do have to put health as our priority because getting it back when you lose it is maybe not even going to be attainable. Dr. Police Coach, this has been a really fascinating conversation. I think we could go on for much longer, but thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Peter, for inviting me. My pleasure. If you'd like to comment on what we've just been talking about this interview or make suggestions for future episodes, you can contact us through our website. That's llamapodcast.com. You can also follow us and leave messages on Facebook and Twitter at Llama Podcast. Thanks for listening.